A lot of exciting things happening this fall. Make sure to jump online, download, download the Trinity app so that you can uh, stay uh, up to date with what is happening uh, related to where you're at in your spiritual journey and how we can come alongside of you and help you continue to grow and live out your Christ identity. I've entitled the message today, Slump Survival Training. You know, sometimes in our Christian life, we find ourselves in a spiritual slump. The heavens seem to be locked up. It seems like our prayers are bouncing off the heavens. Uh, it just kind of seems though we're in a spiritual funk, right? And uh, if we're not careful during times like that, we can feel as though God has abandoned us. And we're going to be looking at the life of David uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, and how in Psalm 13, the psalm we're going to study, there's only six short verses, how David found himself in a spiritual slump. So, uh, out of love and respect for God's Word, please stand for the reading of God's Word, Psalm 13, beginning in verse 1. Here we go. O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes, or I will die. Don't let the enemies gloat, saying, we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Let's pray. Father, just a moment ago we were singing, not to ourselves or to one another necessarily. We were singing to you because of your goodness. Thank you for the songs of praise and worship that remind us of your faithful love that remind us of your goodness and kindness and compassion. Lord, I thank you for everyone that is here today and those within the sound of my voice. Thank you that the Holy Spirit will speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. And I thank you that we'll have ears to hear and hearts to receive your word today. May all distractions be brought to a halt, to a minimum, so we can hear what the Spirit is saying today. It's in the name of every name we pray, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all the people of God said, you may be seated. Okay, anybody in here, have you ever played competitive sports? Raise your hand. All right. So all athletes, you know this about all athletes, sometimes you find yourself in a slump. Not only can athletes find themselves in a slump, but teams can find themselves in a slump. Like, say, the Philadelphia Phillies. Of course, here in West Texas, there are no Phillies fans. I I would hope not. But you know, they hold the record for the most baseball games ever lost by a major league baseball team, 10,500 and counting. Or could you imagine the poor soul who's actually a Cleveland Browns fan? (laughs) Right? You have to be from Ohio to be a Cleveland Browns fan, right? Um, I've shared this several years ago, but actually on July 4th, 2013, Uh, Scott Esminger, he was 55, from Mansfield, Ohio. He died, and in his obituary, he requested, he was a season ticket holder of the Cleveland Browns, you know, he was an ardent fan. He requested the members of the Cleveland Browns team, six pallbearers, to be there for him at his funeral. Because his wishes were, he wanted the Browns to let him down one last time. (laughs) So when it comes to individuals or teams, we can all experience slumps. Industries, whole industries can find themselves in a slump. A country can go through a slump. Businesses, churches experience slumps. And here in Psalm 13, David, in the beginning of of his pursuit of God's promise for his life, being anointed to be the next king, he was in a definite spiritual slump. And here's what you got to love about King David uh, before he was king. David was real. He was raw with his feelings. He was raw with his emotions. And they are recorded, divinely inspired here in the book of Psalms. Not only was he a warrior, he was a worshiper, he was a prophet, and he spoke prophetically. But he was honest and real with his emotions and with his feelings. So many times we put on a happy face. And I understand, you know, there's a certain expectation in our relationships and in public to to maybe look a certain way. 
But if we were really honest and real with the things that we are struggling with as David was here in his prayer to the Lord, uh, maybe we would find the same relief that David did. Now, granted, David wasn't um, spilling his guts out to everybody, but definitely to the Lord. He was being real with his emotions. At this particular time in David's life, he had struggles from within, and he had battles from without. As we talked about last week in our message, Overcoming Obstacles, we talked about the greatest challenges we have are not out here. The greatest challenges in life we'll ever face are really internal. Uh, that many times we want to change the world out here, but until we allow God to change the world in here, the world out here for us may never change. So David had internal struggles, doubt, despair, depression, uh, real trouble in his life. Also externally, Saul, his boss, <laughs> was out to kill him, who happened to be the king and had an army behind him. And David was on the run. He was literally running for his life. So he asks God this question, how long? How long will you forget me? Verse 1, how long will you forget me? You know, that's a familiar question throughout the Bible. I looked it up, and it appears 60 times throughout the Bible. How long? How long? How long? Even our Lord Jesus, he asked this question on at least two occasions. He said, how long must I be with you? How long must I bear with you? I mean, sometimes people can wear your patience thin. And the disciples, on many occasions, they wore the patience of, G of God, right? Jesus thin. He said, I can't wait till I go back to my father. Uh, you guys just, you wear me out, right? How long? How long? Uh, that's the question we ask when our spouse tells us that her family or his family's coming to stay for a few days, right? We're like, how long, right? <laughs> uh, when you go to the doctor's office and you sign in with the receptionist, you ask, uh, how long? How long is this going to be? I just want to bear, I want to bear myself for, for the wait. When you're single, right, and you're believing God for a mate, and it seems like all your friends around you are getting married, you ask the question, how long? But most definitely, when you are going through a trial in your life, one of, the most, uh, one of the questions we ask the most to God is, how long? Matter of fact, David, in six verses, this short psalm, get this, in six short verses, Four separate times, David asks the Lord, how long? How long, O Jehovah, will you forget me forever? How long, Lord, or am I going to be dealing with this? Uh, you're, you're going to be hiding your face from me. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, and how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Four separate times in six verses, David asks the question, this is how you know you're in a slump right? This is one indicator is you're like, oh, I'm losing patience. I can't believe this is happening. And it comes out this way, how long, how long, how long, how long, Lord? Now, thank God David's being real with God. And God, God doesn't mind you being real with him as long as you're respectful with him. Hello? You can be honest and real with your feelings and your emotions before God. Just always maintain, don't cross that line of disrespect uh, with the Lord. But you can be honest. But maybe a better question in life to ask, a more spiritual question, instead of how long, maybe what now? You're going through a trial, you're going through a difficulty, maybe a setback, maybe a personal failure that you're trying to navigate your way out of. Maybe a better question is, okay, Lord, what now? You know, we, uh, one of the songs that we were singing uh, that earlier uh, it said something to the effect, you know, God, if you say no, then I won't go. If you say yes, I will go. If you say jump in, I'm all in, right? That's, that's the heart. That's the attitude what now, God? What now? So, three things. Number one, David had internal struggles. He had internal struggles. <laughs> right here. Internal struggles. Uh, this was David's biggest battle right now. This was David's biggest challenge was the internal struggles. As we talked about, and I'll mention it again, overcoming obstacles, our biggest obstacles in life aren't outside, they're inside. As the old saying goes, and it's true, the heart of the problem is the problem in the heart, right? Our biggest battles, our biggest struggles are internal, not external. And it's not our successes that define us as much as it is our struggles that define us and how we handle those struggles. So here are David's internal struggles. Once again, verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 13. Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? Well, God hasn't forgotten him. And, and David, come on, don't exaggerate. God's not, he had, number one, he hasn't forgotten you, and he's not going to forget you forever. 
How long will you look the other way? God wasn't looking the other way, or why would God even be calling out? Why would David be calling out to God in prayer? How long must I struggle with anguish, here we go, in my soul? With sorrow, here we go, in my heart. So internal struggles. Sometimes our biggest struggles in life, right, are are internal struggles. What are the internal struggles that maybe you're going through today? Nobody on the outside can recognize it. You put on a happy face. You look well put together. <laughs> turn, turn to the person next to you and say, he's talking about you. You're looking good today. Go on. This, you're... Be careful how you say that in, in a godly way. Amen. <laughs> Anguish in my soul with sorrow in my heart every day. How long will my enemy have the upper hand? So, David was going through some internal struggles. Now, when you're in a slump, you're facing some internal struggles, one of the things you can begin to feel, and this is what David was feeling, and be careful, be careful, he was feeling as though God had abandoned him. God had not abandoned him, but David felt like God had abandoned him. You have to be careful with your feelings, because feelings aren't facts. They're information. We sometimes convert feelings into facts, and they're not facts. They're just feelings, and it's okay. You feel that way. But just because you feel a certain way doesn't mean it's true, doesn't mean it's real. The feelings are real, but the information and how you interpret the information from those feelings at times may not be real, and here's where you need to be careful. If you believe something that's not true to be true, if you believe it long enough, then for you it will be true, and you got to be careful. If you believe something that's not true to be true, then for you, you believe it to be true, eventually it will become true, and it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy in your life. So you have to be very, very careful what you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about your current trial, your current, current struggle that you might be going through, because if you believe something long enough and hard enough, for you, that becomes a reality and that's not the type of reality God wants you to have. He does not want you to believe the lie. He wants, as it says uh, in uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, many will believe the lie and so be damned. God wants you to believe the truth because Jesus said it's the truth that sets people free. Be honest with your feelings, but be careful how you interpret those feelings. So many times we feel as though God has abandoned us. He has not. We feel worthless and unworthy, but you are not. So be careful what you feel. But the feeling of abandonment, you know that? Or the, or, or the fear, I should say, of abandonment is one of the greatest fears in life. The fear a wife has that one day her husband may abandon her. The fear a husband could have that one day his wife may abandon him and the kids. And God forbid that it should happen, and at times it does happen. The greatest fear that children have, imagine children live in a world of giants, Little kids, like everything and everyone is bigger than them. That's why kids fantasize and they role play because that's their way of coping with fear. They want to believe they're a superhero. They want to believe they're more powerful than they really are and they're so, they're so delicate. And that's why they need good loving parents to affirm their love for those children as they're growing up in a safe environment so that they could develop and become the full men and women of God that God has destined them to be. But one of the most devastating things that can happen in the life of a child is for her, his or her parents to divorce. And there's no judgment here by me or from me if you have been divorced or you're going through a season of divorce. God hates divorce, and those that have gone through a divorce also hate it because it's just the ripping and the tearing of two souls and of a family. And there are times that it's the only option. And yes, even in the Bible, Jesus, God, through Jesus, gave exceptions Hopefully, it doesn't come to that, but when it does, and if it does, God forbid, moms and dads, you have to be so extra careful because those children, they're the ones, they're the collateral damage. They're the ones that feel the effect. They're the ones that can feel that they're going to be abandoned. And sometimes, even as Christians, we feel as though our loving Heavenly Father has abandoned us, and nothing could be further from the truth. God loves you. That's a non-negotiable in this world that God created. He loved you before you came to Christ. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you now. 
There's nothing you could do to cause God to love you more. There's nothing you could do to cause God to love you less. The one thing you can count on every morning when you wake up and you open your eyes is that God's love for you is unfailing and consistent. But think about David here. David was a giant slayer. David was a man after God's own heart. David was the next king in line to be king. David was a worshiper of God, and if at times he felt as though God had abandoned him, where does that leave us? That's why we have to be reassured by the Holy Spirit regularly. We have to be reassured by the truth of God's word that God has not and will not abandon you. Jesus made a promise in the new covenant in the gospels. He said, I will never leave you. I, oh, those words. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Can we thank God for that? I remember, you know, in high school when you're getting, having your friends uh, to sign your yearbook. Do they still do that? This is like 40 years ago for me. I, I don't know, they even, they even have yearbooks anymore? Anyway, people would sign them, right? Girls you used to date or whatever. Love you forever. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing's forever except Jesus. Come on, God's love, that's forever. You can count on that. <laughs> Charlie Brown, he went up to bat, you know, he struck out. He was feeling so dejected. He said, rats, I'll never make it into the big leagues. That's been my dream all my life, to make it into the big leagues. And then Lucy was there, you know, to console him and to comfort him. She said, Charlie Brown, you're, you're thinking too far ahead. He said, what, what do you mean? She said, you need to set immediate goals for your life, not these long-term goals, and the immediate goals. He said, like what? Like this next inning, when you go out to the mound to pitch, try not to fall down. <laughs> immediate goals. Sometimes we take big, we try to take big, giant steps, right? And we wonder why sometimes we may fall short. We need to take small steps. We need to focus on immediate goals. David, in this psalm, I think he could have related to Charlie Brown. He was feeling the result of this long, drawn-out trial in his life. And it was going to be long and drawn out. You know, we all, we, we, none of us like trials, but if we're going to go through a trial, can I have a short trial, God? Can I put in, you know, a schedule, a short trial, like maybe eight hours worth? You know, maybe two days, three days. But when they go weeks, months, sometimes years, that's when it can begin to wear on you. And it was wearing on David. He found himself in a spiritual slump. Sometimes marriages go through slumps, right? Uh, there's nothing wrong with the marriage. It's just, it's just you're in a slump, right? There are different seasons. And uh, you're, you're no longer in a season of joy and happiness. You're in a marital slump. Uh, when you're in a slump, don't dump. Right? You don't dump the marriage, you know, don't, don't reject, reboot. Uh, it's just a slump. And we have to recognize that we're in a slump. It's not going to last forever. And there are certain things we can do to kind of get our marriage out of this slump. Parenting, sometimes as a parent, you find yourself in a, in a seemingly perpetual slump. You know, the, the kids are acting obnoxious. You know, maybe it's the teen years and they're acting rebellious. And you begin to question, what have we done? And have we done things right? No, we're all human. We live in a, fall, a fallen world. It's just a slump. Slumps don't last. Then there's business slumps, right? Instead of being in a season of reaping, maybe you're in a season of sowing, right? And sometimes it's a, it's a season of death so that there can be a rebirth. And Solomon talks about that in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a time and a season for everything. And then, of course, the spiritual slumps, going through a season of, of testing. And when you're going through a season of testing, sometimes you can overanalyze your situation, begin to feel that God is somehow punishing you. Listen, God doesn't punish his children. Just like good parents don't punish their kids, they discipline them out of love. God will discipline you because he's a loving heavenly father. Hebrews 12 talks about that. But God's not punishing you. Sometimes it's just our own actions that have their own judgment in our life. What a man sows, that, that he shall reap. God has nothing to do with it. It's just the, 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 the spiritual law of sowing and, and reaping. But now we see David, his, his biggest concern is the thought that perhaps God has abandoned him. He felt that way. Those feelings were information, but they weren't factual because the fact remained the same. God had not abandoned David, but he was feeling that way. These were the internal struggles. And it's amazing that David first listed his internal struggles. But not only did he have internal struggles, David had external struggles. 
Uh, look at verses 3 and 4 of, of Psalm 14. Turn and answer me, O Lord, my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes. I love that statement. We're going to come back to that here in a moment. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies, here's the external threat. He had real enemies out to kill him. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. So David felt this clear and present danger closing in on him, the external threats of his physical enemies. Maybe right now you might have some physical enemies, but we all have a spiritual enemy. Your enemy, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And there's nothing more than the devil would enjoy than to gloat over your demise and over your failure and over your defeat and over your downfall. But though a righteous man may fall seven times, will he not rise up again? As I said last week, you might be knocked down, but you're not knocked out. And as long as you won't quit, God won't quit on you. And in the end, you are destined to win. You might lose a few battles along the way, but my friend, you've got to believe you're going to win the war. You're going to win the war. You will overcome. David had these external threats. We have external threats. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And and sometimes all you need is just an encouraging word from somebody. Please, somebody speak a kind word to me, right? <laughs> I think we need to have more random acts of kindness towards one another. You never know what a person is going through. One guy was so overwhelmed uh, by, by the challenges of life, he went to a local diner and he just wanted a good meal, a good breakfast, and a kind word. So he sat at the counter, this big hulking waiter in a dirty t-shirt came up to him and said, what will, what will yours be, Mac? He said, I want two scrambled eggs, and I want some kind words. The guy kind of grunted and walked off. Sometime later, he, he slapped a plate of scrambled eggs in front of that man and turned to walk away, and the man said, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about those kind words? The man turned back to him and said, don't eat them eggs. Sometimes that's all you can get in life out of some people, right? <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> those you love get more kind words, encouraging words, words that build up, because death and life are in the power of the tongue, than words that tear you. The worst thing in life, you go out there and the world beats up on you, then you come home and your family beats up on you. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, our home should be a refuge. Come on, somebody. Our home should be a place of love and affirmation and encouragement. <laughs> And blessing. Speak words of blessing. David was down in the dumps. He was perhaps battling a, a mild case of low-grade depression. Yeah. Now, please don't think if you're battling depression, there's something wrong with you. You're very normal. You're human. You, you, we live in a fallen world. We all have struggles, internal, external struggles. Some have physical struggles. Some of you battle with a, a back problem or, or some, a neck pain or, or some condition. You're believing God for healing. And in the meantime, God's there. His grace is sufficient. When you're weak, then he's strong. Some people it's emotional. Some people it's, it's mental. David definitely was, was feeling this low-grade depression. Many times the church doesn't talk about it. Or if it does, you know, it, it makes people feel as though there's something wrong with them. One of the greatest preachers that's ever lived, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, you know he battled deep, dark depression all his life. He was one of the first preachers to ever be real and transparent, preached thousands of sermons, thousands of people. He had the largest church in the world, like 5,000 people came there in London to hear him preach. And he was very honest with his bouts of depression that he had to deal with. You know, even in the Bible, uh, great men of God, like Elijah, he, he was so down in the dumps, at some, at, at, more than just a spiritual slump. He wanted his life to end. He couldn't take it anymore. God wouldn't let that happen. Let me give you three stages of depression. Number one, number one, discouragement. David felt discouragement. He said, how long will you forget me? Number two, despondency. David felt so despondent based in his circumstance. He said, how long must I struggle with anguish in my soul? And number three, despair. How long will my enemies have the upper hand? He, he was discouraged and despondent, despair, and then those three things can lead you over the edge 
full-blown state of depression. But there's always an answer. There's always a way out. God is always available. David, at this moment in the psalm, he's at his lowest point. His lowest point. But then something's about to happen. He turns to God in prayer, and he says, answer me. And he says, restore the sparkle to my eyes. Oh, I love that phrase. You know, the Bible is filled with such beautiful, poetic, and prophetic statements, unlike any other literature in the world. And here is one of those moments where the prophet of God, the worshiper of God, the, the, the future anointed king of Israel, he says, restore the sparkle to my eyes. You know, let's be honest, some of you have lost the sparkle in your eyes. Now, to a Hebrew, what this meant was a sign of death is the dimming of the light in the eyes because the eyes are a window to the soul. And, and when a person's dying, they lose, a sign of death is they lose the sparkle in their eyes. There's the, 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 the illumination of life is no longer there. And then it just gets darker and darker until their eyes shut and that person dies. David is saying, I've lost the sparkle in my eyes. And if you're here today and you find yourself in a spiritual slump and you've lost the sparkle in your eyes, I want to prophesy over you. I want to speak the word of the Lord over your life. As you turn in faith to the God that loves you, as you turn to him, he will hear you, he will answer you, he will come to you. As you draw nigh unto him, he'll draw nigh unto you. And one of the first things he'll do, he'll restore the sparkle, the life in your eyes. And once again, you will have the look of faith and the look of hope in Jesus' name. And David's about to go from rock bottom, from the, from the pit to the penthouse, in one, in one shift that's about to occur. He went from internal struggle to the external threat to the eternal love. Let's read verses 5 and 6 out loud together. Here we go. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. David made some affirmations. He said, I'm going to trust in God's love. I'm going to rejoice because you have rescued me. This is, was he rescued at that moment? No, but faith always sees in advance what God is going to do and, and declares it to already have been done. Even though he had not yet been rescued in the natural, he was speaking words of faith when he said, you have rescued me and I will sing. Three strong affirmations. I will trust in spite of my circumstances. In what? In God's unfailing love. I will rejoice. Why? Because, past tense, you have already. By faith, I accept it. You have rescued me. And I will sing to the Lord <laughs> because he's been good to me. If the Lord's been good to you, come on, let's give him praise right now. Let's just take a moment and give him praise. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you for your unfailing love. We will rejoice because you have rescued us. You know, we have to be careful. Sometimes we interpret sadness as depression. David may not have been depressed. Maybe he interpreted what we would call depression today to simply be sadness. Now, the devil's a trickster. You know, as a kid growing up, I, I used to love magicians. I had my parents buy me, a, as a little kid, a magician's kit. And uh, for a brief time, I thought maybe I would be become a magician <laughs> in life. It was just so cool, the tricks they could pull. They would, they would have you watch this hand, and with sleight of hand, the other hand, they would pull off the trick. And they would do it so, so effectively, they would get you to suspend belief long enough to believe in the unbelievable, that the pigeons were there and they're gone. I saw that with my own eyes. It's magic. No, it's trickery. That's all it is. But it appears to be true, but it's not. And the devil is the great deceiver. He is the great magician, right? He gets us momentarily to suspend 
our belief in God and God's goodness just long enough to create the illusion in your mind and in your heart that somehow, some way, God has abandoned you and that God no longer loves you and for that brief moment, you're not even worthy any longer. But how many know the devil is a liar? And the Bible says, uh, let God be true and every man a liar. You've got to believe the truth about God's unfailing love. It'll never let you down, child of God. You've got to believe in God's power and ability to rescue you. And you've got to believe in his goodness. And before you ever see one circumstance in your life change, you need to begin to rejoice and sing as though it's already been done. Because according to God's promise, it's been signed, sealed, and delivered. So many times people feel so worthless. They believe the devil's lie that he has abandoned me, and he hasn't. And so many people, they treat the symptom and not the source in life. You know, I have a friend, his, his, his daughter's in this service, he's a Christian psychiatrist. And uh, he's a godly, spirit-filled man. And at times, he prescribes medication to people that are going through difficult, traumatic moments in their life. But his wisdom and his experience and his advice and his training, it's only temporary. It's only temporary because we want to treat the source of this. And isn't it wonderful to know that God will always treat the source because he is the great physician and he wants to bring complete healing and wholeness in your life. And he is doing it even now. Even though you may not see anything in the natural, you can count on the fact that Jesus bore your sicknesses and your diseases and by his stripes you are healed. And beloved, I wish above all that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And God, in spite of the lies of the devil, God has declared you to be worthy. Listen, sometimes we have to battle the sense and feeling of unworthiness. If you have just one person in your life, one person in your life that needs your love, your life has meaning. And even if you don't have a person in your life right now that needs your love, you are worthy of God's love. And God wants you to know what makes you worthy is the fact he loves you as an individual. And you've heard this before, but it's factually true. If you were the only person in the world that needed salvation, Jesus would have come and bled and died just for you. That's how valuable you are to God who created you. Woo! Amen. All right. How many of you have ever hit a home run, not an infield home run. I mean over the fence home run, raise your hand. I hate you, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was the lousiest baseball player. Of course I never made it junior high team or even high school. I quit in Little League. I was so bad I couldn't even get out of Little League. I just didn't get the athletic gene from my dad. Nope, didn't transfer it down to me. I tried so hard. Matter of fact, about 12 years ago, uh, we, we started a church league church softball team. And the guy said, hey, Pastor Carl, you want to be on, on, the, on the church uh, softball team? I said, yeah, yeah. I thought, you know, I'd been lifting weights. and I was kind of in my prime, you know, what, 38, 39, 44, whatever, whatever. And I said, yeah, man. I said, let's do this. And you know, that softball comes so slow. It like, takes very like, oh, oh, oh. And then I'm like, I'm going to hit that thing. I'm going to cream it. I'm going to hit a home run, right? <sighs> I could never get it close to the fence. I just, I couldn't. And then St Pastor Stacy Ward, he walks up behind me. They pitch at him, boom, whoo, over the fence. I couldn't believe my eyes. I thought it was trickery. I thought he was a magician. I said, I think my arms are bigger than his arms, you know, not by much, but I mean, like, I know he's younger than me, you know, but really? Then he got up again. And I thought, you know what? I don't like softball. I quit. <laughs> I, I, I see, I've learned one thing in life. If you're not good at something, <laughs> just quit. <laughs> you know, you can't quit everything. Just the key in life is find out what you're good at and do that, and then be happy, right? <laughs> uh, how many have ever hit a hole in one? Raise your hand. Hole in one. Oh, look at you. Wow. 
One. <laughs> there was like three last service, right? Uh, that's amazing. I have a friend. He's a pastor in Leveland, Eddie Trice. He's preached here before, right? He, the first time he went out golfing, he hit a hole in one. You know he's never golfed since? I said, well, how come? He said, that's the goal of golf, to get a hole in one. He said, once I reach perfection, why would I try to repeat that? <laughs> Imagine all the money and time he has saved <laughs> because he quit golf after the first time he went out. He hit a hole in one. You know, Babe Ruth, he, uh, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, he hit 714 home runs, but he also struck out 1,330 times. And there were times that Babe Ruth found himself in a batting slump, but it never really bothered him. And uh, he was once asked by a reporter, how do you keep yourself from being discouraged? And Babe Ruth said, I realize the, lo- the law of averages will catch up. If I just keep swinging, in fact, when I'm in a slump, he said, I feel sorry for the pitcher because I know that sooner or later he's going to pay for it. I want you to know, child of God, you might be in a spiritual slump. Just keep on swinging because the law of averages will kick in and the devil's going to pay for ever doubting you. Just keep on swinging in your marriage. Just keep on swinging in your faith. Just keep on swinging in your business. Just keep on swinging at the dream of God in your heart and eventually you're going to knock that thing right out of the park and then you're going to run around the bases all the way to home plate knowing that you just hit a home run for Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today. I know there are some in service today, and those that are watching that are in a spiritual slump. Maybe it's internal struggles. Maybe it's an external threat. But may they focus on the eternal love, God's your unfailing love for them. God, may they focus on your goodness. Like David, may they by faith declare, the Lord has healed me. The Lord has delivered me. The Lord has rescued me. The Lord will fulfill his promise in my life. And so I can sing, and I can rejoice in the goodness of the Lord. Father, I thank you for marriages coming out of a spiritual slump. I thank you for businesses coming out of a spiritual slump. In Jesus' name, thank you for your goodness, Father. Now, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, Lord and Savior, you've never been born again, I want you to know the Bible says in Revelation 3.20, the Lord stands at the door and he knocks. And if you'll hear his voice and open up the door of your heart, Christ will come into you, and you can have fellowship with him, and he'll have fellowship with you. If you're here today and you need to rededicate your life to the Lord, you've been in a spiritual slump way too long, and you need to come back home, child of God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. It's very important that you say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my Father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together, church family?